Good morning. Good morning. I'm Susan McDaniel, a member of this congregation. Today I'm going to be talking about who are the we and who are the they, neo-diversity in America. In the last few days of his life, Martin Luther King Jr. said, there are difficult days ahead. And now, still, there are difficult days ahead. During this sermon, I will be telling some stories and asking some thorny questions. I will be asking you to look deep into yourself and see what you carry with you. And I will be asking you to decide what you can do going forward and how you can do it. A few weeks ago, I stumbled upon the work of a professor of psychology at NCSU, Dr. Rupert W. DeCoste. This is his book that I read. I believe he was being interviewed by Frank Stacio on WUNC's The State of Things about this most recent book, Taking on Diversity, How We Can Move from My Anxiety to Respect. In this book, Nacoste, a large Louisiana black Creole, discusses and analyzes neo-diversity through the writings and observations of his students. He has been working on diversity issues since he was in the Navy from 1974 to 1977 when he was stationed on an aircraft carrier in the midst of a race riot. He speaks to the challenges we all face when interacting with someone who is in some way different from us. And he provides guidance and tools for handling these situations. I've been looking for this book all my whole life. Rather than just trying to be more tolerant, I have insights, tools, and examples to help me. This book answers the questions of what to do, what to say, and how to act when we encounter intolerance towards someone or some group. What is neo-diversity? In our world, each and every day, we interact with someone from a different racial, gendered, sexually oriented, physically challenged, ethnic, religious, bodily conditioned, or mentally challenged group. No longer is it black and white, not just diverse, but neo-diverse. And when we encounter someone who is different, we become anxious. We are anxious because we are not sure of how to interact with them. We are afraid of offending them. We are unsure of what to call them. We aren't sure how to find common ground with them. I am a Unitarian Universalist, and many of you probably self-identify as Unitarian Universalist as well. After all, we are in a Unitarian Universalist church. But I also self-identify as agnostic, and perhaps some of you do as well. Some of you may also self-identify as Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, pagan, earth-based, or something else. I also self-identify as a lesbian, a person with a mental illness, a white American, and a person with a fairly high level of intelligence. So when I ask, who are the we and who are the they, there are many, many answers. If you are male and are interacting with me or another woman, then you are the they in terms of gender. If you are Christian, then for me, you are the they. Obviously, I could go on and on. This is the essence of neo-diversity. We are all in different groups in some aspect of our history and our self-identity. Here's what happened. Pat was waking up from anesthesia they had given her for the somewhat minor surgery on her knee. I was sitting with her as she woke up and watched as a procession of people came by to write things in her chart or check up on her. People watching is one of my favorite things. One nurse's name was Monique. 
She and her coworkers were all white. This is important to the story, so I repeat, Monique and her coworkers were all white. Monique's coworkers were teasing her, calling her Monique. She was irritated by this and corrected them with the proper pronunciation of Monique. This interchange of mispronunciation and correction happened several times. I was watching this with some amusement and some concern. It was clear to me that Monique was not happy with this teasing. Then, as Monique was finishing her notes in Pat's chart, one of the other nurses changed the pronunciation again and called her Moniqua. She said, my name is Monique. I'm not some jungle bunny, and walked away. I'm going to step away from this story for a minute. I want to establish some definitions of the words prejudice, bigotry, and racism, as presented in the Costs book. Prejudice is the negative prejudgment of any person or group of people. Prejudices are internally held beliefs that exist in every individual and are based on stereotypes. As Nakast says, there are no innocent. There are no innocent. We all, whether we like it or not, have prejudices that we have learned throughout our lives. None of us is without prejudice. I believe that most of us here probably actively work to overcome our prejudices but we still have them. Bigotry, on the other hand, is the outward expression of a prejudice in language or action. An inaction or avoidance is an action. Monique's statement that she is not a jungle bunny is a bigoted remark. She voices her prejudice about blacks, African Americans, and black names. So both bigotry and prejudice are individual. They are in people. Racism is not. Racism is institutional and organizational. It is in the laws and customs of a group or society. Racism authorizes and supports prejudice and bigotry. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. So we no longer have U.S. or state laws that support and sanction racism. However, in spite of the Civil Rights Act, racism still exists in our country. Many recent events have highlighted the racism in some police departments. The lopsided populations of our prisons and jails are indicators of the racism in our criminal justice system. Prosecutors, judges, and juries to bigoted decisions and actions are supported by this institutionalized racism. So back to my story about Monique. I was stunned by what Monique said. I was frozen and could not think of what to say. So I didn't say anything. I looked around, expecting and hoping someone would say something. But no one else said anything either. I certainly did not expect Monique to say what she said. But who would? So here are some of the thorny questions I promised. Is it ever OK to use group slurs? It is not okay for someone else to call me dyke, bull dyke. But is it okay for me to use that group slur to myself or other lesbians? And gay men to call each other faggot? Is it ever okay for blacks to call themselves or others nigger? Is Monique prejudiced? Is she bigoted? Is she racist? She clearly has some prejudices about blacks, African Americans, and black slash African American names. And she voiced those prejudices, making the label bigot appropriate. 
but as she is not an institution, organization, law, or culture, she should not be labeled racist. Was Monique being bullied? I believe that this teasing or something similar had gone on before between Monique and her coworkers. I believe that this behavior was bullying. For whatever reason, her coworkers harassed Monique about her name. But does the bullying forgive the slur? No, it does not. It absolutely does not. If Monique did not like the teasing and bullying, she could have confronted those who were bullying her and asked them to stop. On the other hand, she may not have felt safe doing so, and so instead, she lashed out at a group of people not present. The object of the bigotry does not have to be present for the bigotry to be present. Monique had no social filter for her prejudice. Her prejudice is primal. And if I had said something, she might have been very confused and surprised because for her, there was nothing wrong with what she said. In a sense, the prejudice that she has is invisible to her. Was my inaction also a form of bigotry? Was my letting this go by without reacting bigotry? Yes, I'm afraid it is. Freezing up in these situations is actually the norm. We are caught off guard and we don't know what to say. We look around to see if someone else will address it. But perhaps all we need to say is, excuse me, I find that language offensive. It hurts me. Nacost suggests that this method of confronting bigotry personalizes our reaction. Most people don't want to hurt those around them. And most of the time, the person will stop and think before using such language in the future. I like this. I'm sorry. I find that language offensive. It hurts me. Now, I pride myself on being accepting and respecting others who are different from me. Many of us do. But now I'm really going to challenge you. Think about the following descriptors. Grossly obese, effeminate man, manly woman. Obese people are gross. Clearly, men shouldn't be effeminate, right? And women sure, certainly shouldn't be manly, should they? I would like you to think about how you react and feel and then interact with the following people. A woman wearing a men's suit and tie. A woman wearing an abaya, the full dress-like overgarment, and a niqab, the full face covering worn by many Muslim women. A man wearing a dress and carrying a purse. A person walking down the street, wearing a helmet, gas mask, knee pads, elbow pads, and heavy boots. A man wearing a turban or a long white tunic and a takiyah. A man whose pants ride down around his bottom with his underwear showing, a ball cap with a straight brim cocked slightly to one side. A person with a pierced eyebrow, a pierced nose, several ear piercings, a pierced tongue, and several lip piercings. Lip piercings. A person who is obese and is eating a piece of cake or some ice cream or something else sweet. A person who is stumbling down the street. A person walking down the street with a grocery cart full of stuff who smells is wearing filthy clothes and talking to him or herself. A person with a noticeably deformed arm or leg or face. Do you feel awkward? Do you avoid them? Do you turn your head? 
Here is another story. I was at the post office recently to pick up a certified letter. One of the clerks is an Asian woman who speaks with an Asian accent. I had a swift, visceral, internal, prejudicial reaction. Why was a foreign-born Asian woman working in the U.S. post office, an American, i.e., someone without a foreign accent, should have this job? I was stunned by my reaction. It totally blew me away. I had no idea that that prejudice was in me. It was and is very painful for me to realize it. As I waited for my turn, I tried to analyze my reaction. Would I react this way to anyone working at the U.S. Post Office who had a foreign accent? Was it because she is Asian? Would I feel this way if she had an English, Irish, or Australian accent? Why do I feel that a person working at the post office should be someone born in the U.S.? Perhaps she was born in the U.S. And do I feel this way about any U.S. government job? I'm unable to answer these questions. I don't know if another English accent would trigger this. I don't know if I would feel this way about any government job. I don't know if other accents would trigger this. I do know that I will continue to be aware of my reactions in situations like these. I do know that I will keep working on my prejudices. I do know that I will not speak or act with bigotry. I do know that I will continue to react to offensive language against any person or group by saying, I'm sorry, I find that language offensive. It hurts me. Or, excuse me, I find that language offensive. It hurts me. Will you repeat after me? I'm sorry. I find that language offensive. It hurts me. Again, I'm sorry. I find that language offensive. It hurts me.